Thank you for coming. This is SVA Presents the Art of Horror, uh, the gory details of graphic novels. My name is Phil Jimenez. I'm a writer and artist for DC Comics, and I'm an instructor here at SVA. Um, all of you, did you get this little orange paper? Yeah. So uh, this is the list of extended credits for most of our panel. Uh, to speed into this presentation, I'm just going to introduce them by name fairly quickly. Just talk. Uh, uh, about their titles very quickly, and then we're going to move on after a hearty round of applause. Um, I think we shall start with uh, Nathan Fox, um, who's the chair of the MFA Visual Narrative Program here at SVA, and also known for um, his artwork on DMZ and Pigeons from Hell. Mark Doyle, uh, who's an editor at uh, DC Comics Vertigo. Um, who works on books like American Vampire, uh, Trillium, and The Wake. Then we have Rafael Albuquerque. Do you prefer Rafa? Sure. Um, <laughs> who's known for, uh, uh, he's a co-creator of American Vampire. Uh, he's also worked on Blue Beetle and Superman, Batman, Sean Murphy, excuse, um, who's not here, Scott Snyder, um, who's crazy talented, uh, best known for American Vampire and The Wake at Vertigo, and he's also doing things like Batman and Swamp Thing. And a, our uncredited, but very excited to have guest, uh, Becky Cloonan, who has worked on books like The Meyer, American Vampire, and Batman. Is that good? Excellent. So how are you guys tonight? Good? good. You ready to very talk good. about horror? Sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, so before we begin, I thought, or actually as we begin, one of the things I wanted to ask our, the panel, um, was what is horror to you? How do you define it? Especially since you guys are credited with working with it uh, in a graphic medium. I don't know, can I take this off? Is that yeah. Okay? Um, and my hope guys, if you'd like, please have a conversation amongst yourselves. Uh, don't necessarily need to talk to me, talk to you or the audience as well. I think, um, at least for me, I mean horror, I was, I've always been a huge horror fan. I was joking before that, like, when I grew up, actually, this is my old stomping grounds. I grew up at Waterside, you know, on 23rd Street and East River. And uh, there was a movie uh, store not far away called The Video Stop. Did any of you guys used to hear when this was here? It was only a few years ago it closed. But they wouldn't rent or R-rated movies to kids, but they would deliver them to your house if you ordered them. So I would get, like, all the 80s slasher films as a kid all the time. And I don't know if it's because I wanted to see, like, the popular kids get killed or what. But <laughs> anyway, the... Um, to me, I think horror, I, I really love, I, I grew up loving Stephen King, was my first almost big literary influence, and I think the thing he taught me um, was that the scariest stuff to me, I guess, is the stuff when you take something that you, is like a totem of safety for you, the thing that you think is, is, is something that's un, impenetrably safe, and you turn it into this murderous thing coming for you, so he's great at that with, you know, the pet dog, the family dog, your car, your father, you know, your son in Pet cemetery, all of those things that you find safety in or identity in turning into a kind of monster that comes for you. And I think that's what's great about the classic monsters as well. You know, like those, they were kind of designed to do that. You know, like, you know, vampires, not the sparkly kind, but like vampires, like they're, they're designed to be like your neighbors turn into these murderous things that come to get you or your family. And your werewolf is your own body turns into this horrifying thing. And zombies, same thing, you know? And, so I don't know, that's to me, I guess, the what horror at core, like what I try, what, I, what scares me the most is that, I guess, that sort of constellation of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, it's interesting that you mentioned vampires just because that was, I mean, they were originally created to kind of explain things like tuberculosis and diseases that we may not understand or, you know, uh, why fingernails keep growing after death and hair and things like that. So that people would, things that you don't understand, you create something kind of scary that you can, you may not understand it, but you can put a monster's face on it so it, it, it's and it's kind of cool that it's survived long enough to become like classic at this yeah. point uh, I, I guess I was just gonna kind of leap off I guess of what what you guys have already started I mean like imaginative loss you know like the the scariest thing I ever saw was Jaws or at least like the the beginning of it because when we were a kid we went to I grew up in Houston you know going to Galveston and Laporte and you know swimming out there and immediately the first the first evil thing I see on TV is, you know, a, uh, a trailer for that movie. And, yeah. you know, as a kid, it just, it really just kind of freaks you out because 
anything and everything is living in there and you think you know the world revolves around you and you know these realities kind of start flooding home so i think the you know like the manipulation of that i thought was amazingly fascinating you know and so like those those imaginative things made real you know they kind of send chills down your spine of, of realization you know and, and i you know identity loss you know that where you just you have no control um, you know, and the world suddenly expands, you know, and it's something that surprises you is, is, was gripping. Yeah, I agree with you. I like a lot more this kind of psychological kind of horror than, I mean, I know I, we do a very gore kind of horror thing, but, um, I like a lot, I like a lot when you, you know, it, it's something, um, that disturbs you is in your head or something, you know? Um, something that you can, it's not a physical thing that's going to attack you, but something you cannot control, maybe. I mean, it's very scary, the idea that people don't believe you or stuff like that, you know? That you're, uh, how can I say, like against a wall, maybe. Um, yeah, I felt really bad for like the boy who cried wolf. And he got, he got eaten, it was like, no! <laughs> But how I mean, how scary! I, I know, right? But how process. how scary would that have been? It, it everything comes real, and it's like he it's like he brought it. Sure. Well, speaking you know? of this, so um, I was doing a little bit of research on um, film, horror film, and uh, one of the things uh, that I discovered was that almost from the beginning, horror film actually dealt with supernatural threats. Um, they were sort of implicitly, explicitly supernatural. Uh, and I was curious about your take on horror and if there is a difference between horror and thriller. Um, does horror have to have something supernatural or can horror be Jaws? Can, it be, can there be something horrific in, in nature? I don't know for sure, but I think it could. <laughs> <laughs> There's a right answer. <laughs> I, I mean, the, the word the word thriller, I think, at least I don't know. It seems more box officey, like slasher, gore. Yeah, kind of should be gore. Yeah, like I'm running from something, right? But like horror feels, you know, like that seems internalized, like maybe something supernatural. You know, like Poltergeist was a, a mainstream movie, but that was like full on horror. Uh, but what are its components? Because it's it's a supernatural film. Yeah. Right. So so, um, I guess that, yeah. That was that was sort of what I was trying to get to, and I was thinking about this today, about the sort of layers of horror. And it seems that most horror, or what we describe as horror, um, relies on the supernatural. And the reason I'm interested in this, as it pertains to the panel, is that the supernatural, in many ways, our fear of it. Um, or respect for it has to do with our upbringing, usually our religious beliefs. And I was curious with you how much or how little your religious beliefs play into um, the horror that you write and the way you receive horror in books and TV. Well, I'm uh, <clears throat> an atheist with no religious beliefs and uh, to my mother who's Christian, that is horror. <laughs> Wait, your mother is afraid of horror or Just she's your no horror? No afterlife, no soul, no morality in her eyes. Um, that's probably too complicated an answer for the question, though. No, not at all. Anyone else? She's saying that's horror for her. Yeah. Well, I think, um, I, I don't, I wasn't, I mean, I was raised, I wasn't, my parents aren't particularly religious or anything like that. I think, I guess you're quite, going back to your question about the supernatural um, in general, I think, I think, for me, I guess my my favorite horror. When I hadn't thought of it that way, actually, you know, the, a dichotomy between thriller and, and horror. But I think of movies like Psycho or those kinds of things that I guess would fall under thriller in some way if there's not, um, you know. But to me, that's still it's horror as long as I think, you know, it it provokes that same kind of anxiety, you know, in that way. To me, I mean, one of the things I guess that I love about horror is that it's a way of dealing with the unknown too, is even as it makes you sort of afraid of it, like you were saying, Nathan, I think, in some ways, like Jaws, but, you know, and on the wake, that's a lot of fun, we have a lot of fun with the ocean in that way, but that, I don't know, for me, I think about, like, growing up and when my my grandmother died or when someone died in my family, there was a strange refuge in, in, in horror as well, because it's almost like a strange soothing, like, an, uh, uh, like because the supernatural elements almost 
prove that there's something beyond in some way, even as you destroy them and they're monstrous and there's, they're horrible. They're almost, there's something that kind of takes what's unknown and makes it, even though it's horrific and monstrous, it makes it um, beyond your understanding, I guess, mm -hmm. in a way that's comforting. I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. I hope that makes sense, but. No, I think that, I think that makes total sense. I think that's why vampires are thrilling to people. Um, because it, uh, most horror is, it's about death. That's the thing that we're all the most afraid of, right? No, nobody wants to die, but, so, but if you, if you, zombies, vampires, all these things say like, maybe death isn't final, you know? Yeah. And with vampires, it's, maybe it could be kind of sexy too. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, th I think horror is probably at the, uh, the part of the oldest part of our brain is fear. I think even uh, an amoeba has some sense of pain, fear, to some degree. And uh, as you get towards the outer side of our brain, that's what sort of where society and social memories come in. And thrillers, I think, sort of play on that. Because a thriller is a horror movie with a little bit more to it. Like you said, uh, vampire. Well, that not only are you afraid of being bitten, but now you're dealing with sort of mythology and history and society of the, the villagers who are afraid of the castle, and you sort of apply more uh, IQ points to it. And sometimes, I guess, I wonder. I was my wife. Uh, I I I, uh, I have a lot. I had a lot of anxiety as a kid. You know, I'm on, I've always had anxiety, and I'm on medication for anxiety and stuff. And my wife. So my wife reads a lot about anxiety because she's afraid our kids are going to have it, like the way that I have it. And one of the things that was interesting was she was saying that exposure to um, uh, horror or things that are like scary as a kid, they think, you know, can also provoke anxiety uh, attacks in kids and stuff. And one of the things, and yes, so well, there you go. Thanks, mom. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> video stop. But um, one of the things I guess that I, I thought was interesting about that was that my son, who's six, he's fascinated by the undead too, like, but like in a childlike way, like well, go he calls them like a ghosty. He's like, well, but then he uses those as ways of asking about death a lot mm -hmm. of the time. Like he wanted a, I think I told you this, Phil, but he wanted a skeleton from the last Comic Con uh, a couple times ago, and I couldn't find one. All I could find was this stuffed Grim Reaper, and I brought it home and I gave it to him, and he loves it. It's really creepy. He sleeps with it and has like a little scythe, <laughs> so you see it in there, and it's like it's pretty horrifying. It glows, but um, there's something also oddly comforting in the idea that to me, I think. Anxiety is about, or at least about not being able to sit with uncertainty. That you cannot be okay with not knowing the answer to something and you just fixate and fixate and fixate and go down the spiral. And in a lot of ways, I think horror is comforting as much as it provokes that because it does give you a stand in for the thing you're most afraid of and it's knowable, even if it's something horrific like that, like a vampire or a serial killer or as an embodiment of the randomness of death or anything like that, there's something reflexively, I guess, soothing. As strange as that sounds, at least to me, because the bigger unknown is now embodied in something. Do you know what I mean? And I, that I absolutely do. A uh, quick anecdote, not really about horror, but about children dealing with death. A uh, really good friend of mine, her, um, the first weekend she spent away from her son, when she came back, her son was in tears because he thought his mom had died because it was the first time in his life she'd gone away for more than an hour or two. He was gone, she was gone for a whole weekend because he was with dad. And she'd been searching for ways to talk about death and dying. And, and, and um, it was very clear that even at a very young age, it was, that, that was a, a primal fear for this kid that something bad was gonna happen to his mom and he would never see her again. Rafa, I wanted to ask you, do you still live in Brazil? Yes. Um, I, one of the things I'm, I'm always curious about uh, with any sort of genre is if horror is culturally specific. If you found, sort of uh, being raised in Brazil, that there are certain things culturally that, you, that are horrifying to you that might not be to Americans or to someone else in another part of the world, um, like, are you like, vampires, stupid, you know, or, or werewolves, right. they don't have those in Brazil, I don't care. Um, <laughs> or or, is, there, or is, there some, is there something that you find that we're afraid of here that you're not at all? I think that that, that sense for all kinds of story. Uh, if it's a, if it, a horror story works here, it will, and it's a good story, it will work out the same way in China or Brazil or wherever, because it brings with, it plays with the same elements, I mean, human element. 
Although, although uh, in, in prepping for this, I was reading about changes, for example, in Japanese horror films. Mm -hmm. uh, the translations, when they remake them, they, they translate very differently because there are certain cultural aspects to the horror that are stripped from them and replaced with American conventions. <coughs> oh, oh, sure, I understand, but I'm saying that uh, it's the same story, right? Yes. But it, it might be told differently, but it's the same kind of story. I mean, it will work out the same way. Uh, so, well, my reference is special in comics. That's what I consume the most. Mm -hmm. um, we, in Brazil, we, we consume a lot of American comics and American movies as well. So it is pretty much the same. Sorry, disappointing, but it no, is no, pretty no. much the same, same kind of reference. But yeah, there are some very cool. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, there are some, some cool uh, old stories, I mean, uh, uh, traditional stories, you know, ancient stories almost about the Indians and mm -hmm. stuff like that. That can be very scary and could be like a very good story. Uh, I'm just always curious, uh, again, culture, sometimes language, um, uh -huh. uh, and a, a religious upbringing, if it affects our relationship with horror, if uh, the way we see something or receive something is changed depending on where we were raised or obviously how we were raised. I definitely believe in sort of the universal uh -huh. sort of truths of, of certain things, but I think culturally there are different specifics oh, sure. that make things like scary, for example, in Asia that would not be to us or vice versa, that we have to transform oh, right. to make them uh, work for, for us culturally. Uh, I think so. Yeah? I, I do, I think, I mean, Maybe just because we do a lot of, we've been, it's fun to do the research for American Vampire, that mm -hmm. stuff, or when we did The Wake, like looking up folklore and legends of different cultures. And it's interesting how they are, I think, there's sort of indigenous horror to some extent. And it's more the trappings of it, I guess. But like, yes. but that uh, I was doing a book, uh, Severed for Image, that's about like a hobo, a guy that's a traveling salesman and eats kids, you know, and goes around. And, and, uh, and looking at the folklore at that time, or the the fears about transients and stuff, you know, they're very culturally specific. They're also really terrifying because they t tap into this kind of primal thing you like to romanticize, and then it flips it around. So th those things are interesting. You know, you look at American ghost stories, and a lot of them have to do with the road or picking up a traveler, things like that, that are permutations of you know European ghost stories. But I mean, still, they become culturally specific, and it's fun to kind of pick out the things and use them in comics or stories that are, you think hit the rawest nerve, because they're also things that you kind of romanticize. And that's another thing I think Stephen King does really well with like old, you know, with uh, Americana, turning it, things that we take pride in as part of our identity culturally, and then making them menacing in some way, you know? And whereas I read a lot of, or not a lot, but I went. I like to. Um, I went through a phase of reading uh, more. Um, a, a friend started giving me a lot of contemporary um, Japanese literature translated, like Natsuo Kurino and Ryu, Ryu Murakami and a couple of other people. And um, ghosts and the haunting quality is very, you know, sort of permeates that without mm -hmm. the same sort of shock of horror, where it's much more a low, slow burn, you know. Uh, almost alienated, isolated, creepy kind of feeling. I don't know, there's a lot of, it's interesting. I do think it can be, I think it's not that, you know, horror is culturally specific and that things wouldn't be scary in another culture, but that they hit different nerves. And when you feel, I feel like you get something that's particular to your homeland, it can be doubly scary when someone flips it just the right way, you know? That's what I found when Scott first pitched American Vampire to me. There were a lot of aspects of it that I liked, but one of the things that I thought you really tapped into was taking American icons and turning them into monsters so that the cowboy becomes a monster mm -hmm. or the flapper becomes a monster. Um, and even if we, we like these characters or sort of love to hate them or whatever in the book, even when they're doing something good, there's always that scary thing that's mm -hmm. right under the surface with those characters that they could flip and they could, they could lash out at you mm -hmm. or whatever. And so it's finding those things that we all love and respect or put on a pedestal and then making them scary to you. What's scarier, the supernatural or the natural? What's more horrific, um, like the sort of demonic or um, kind of psychological? Um, uh, and then one of the other things I wanted to talk about was women in horror, um, both as a character trope and um, as a sort of creator. 
first, the first question, though, is um, in reading a little bit about, again, American horror film, uh, horror over the decades tends to reflect the fears of the day. Atomic horror, nuclear horror, slasher horror, <laughs> like serial killer horror tends to sort of reflect the news of the day. Um, do you find that you are affected by that? Uh, like, are you, when you write or approach horror or read it, are you looking for metaphors talking about the times? Um, do you prefer something that's a little less uh, epic specific, if that makes any sense? A little more timeless? Anyone? <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't think about it, I guess, in that way. I kind of, something will catch my eye that I, I find creepy, and then I just sort of try and unpack it for myself and yeah. figure out why it's personally scary and then build out of that. And sometimes I think those fears are, are more um, contextual or are more sort of uh, a product of or engendered by what's happening in the world at that moment. And other times, I think they're just sort of primal fears, you know? I think I, I was thinking a lot about the, the B-movies of the 50s, specifically, which were all about the fears of yeah. sort of the, the atomic age. And a giant monster is born of atomic energy or a fear of sort of nuclear radiation, et cetera. Godzilla, in his way, is sort of a perfect example of that. Or the other. There's what? So much fear of, like, So much fear of the other. Yeah. Some people, t uh, someone t was reading... Um, uh, the Walking Dead is like a fear of overpopulation. All this, I don't know if I buy that, but I thought it was sort of interesting about what we bring to horror from the day, but also horror as metaphor. Um, and that's one of the reasons I was interested in the supernatural versus uh, the natural, because uh, supernatural tends to be metaphor for something else. You, it's usually a stand-in. Um, I think... Um well, we were talking earlier like about the boy who cried wolf. A lot of horror, I think, uh, through the ages has been used to um, teach, mm -hmm. you know, like lessons and, you know, don't go into the woods because there's a monster there, this kind of thing. And it, it's, uh, you know, parables and uh, this kind of thing. But then also, I mean, I'm going to have to bring up Lovecraft, of course. And you say the fear of the unknown could be, uh, horror can be comforting because now you know it's out there, but then Lovecraft was like the opposite of that because it was... You know, you see something and you completely lose your, lose your mind. And he was very like xenophobic, and very much, you know, a fear of the other. Right. And I wonder if he um, he kind of died, like starved and alone, <laughs> and unsuccessful. <laughs> but then he found this big popularity later. And I wonder if that's because it came. Um, like I never really thought of it, but maybe people didn't. Yeah, yeah like he was ahead of his time, yeah. Um, yeah. in in thinking about the fear of the other and the fear of the unknown and, um, you know, this. Uh, kind of cosmic horror. Totally, yeah. Uh, really weird stuff, like like the first person to really mix science fiction and horror. Yeah. And that didn't really come about until later, so now he's kind of this cult author. Yeah. Um, you know, for better or worse, but... I think that when, when you do talk about, like, a metaphor, though, mm -hmm. I think if you start with metaphor, it makes for bad story. Because... Because I think we like to identify with people and we like to identify with characters and we need to, if you start the story, the story's about, you know, she walks down the street and this happens to her. If you start with, so there's this big thing that everyone's afraid of and then it's, it's just gonna be too big and too concepty. so you need to start there and start telling that story and then the metaphors come to start, it. Okay. As well, you well, yeah, it becomes you know, starting well, with the crutch. <laughs> right. We'll, we'll, wait, wait, wait. We'll, we'll come back like to that. <laughs> we'll come back to that because we'll, uh, that'll be a really interesting part of process. Um, the final question I had, though, in this sort of section um, is I was also, uh, again, in my research, thinking a lot about female characters in horror, and particularly since the um, 70s, their sort of presence as uh, usually the, the sort of the hero of most horror tales particularly in film, often in TV. Uh, you know, they're usually good, they're feisty, they're strong, often virginal. Um, and I was curious what your take was on the importance uh, or being aware of um, women, women as trope, um, how often you use them in your fiction, particularly your horror fiction. Anyone, anyone? 
I was I was always intrigued with uh, I guess I guess Alien had a huge impact on me. One for the exploding chest, but two for uh, the amazing uh, Sigourney Weaver, which came in the end when she put the suit on. Uh, but you know that that idea of that like strong character in this really horrific scene, and you don't see any of the beast, right? You don't really. Right. It only it only has so much. It's like Silence of the Lambs. I think. He was in there for like 15 minutes total. Uh, Hannibal, right? In the in the complete 17 minutes, I think. Yeah, collection of the movie. But it was it was that conversation and that that uh, it, it was that character kind of overcoming fear, but overcoming things for everybody else that I really thought was a very strong um, a strong quality that in men it's like they kind of do stuff for themselves or they do it for the group or, you know, like I'd never really been around strong men growing up, but the women I knew could, you know, knock down walls with their pinkies. You know I mean? It's just, these were, these were women that could just rule the earth. So like seeing something like that really kind of ingrained, you know, that type of, I guess that type of trope or that type of character in terms of horror. And it was, it was really fascinating to see kind of that, that genre and that character style, I guess, evolve. I feel like um, these characters also are characters that, um, you know, they're women, yes, but then they're, um, they're, it's not like they're thrown in there to be a woman, you know, like you could take their gender and switch it and it wouldn't be an issue, you know what I mean, for the most part. Um, they're not just thrown in that. there. Well, they're not just thrown into there to be the girl in the, in the story. They're not like, okay, well, you know, Ripley, um, I mean, it would change the story, of course, if she was a guy. But she's not written in there to be like, okay, well, there's, it's not like there's this girl. It's like, no, there's this person, Ripley. Right, and she was right, that was a male character to begin with. It was, right. yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, I think that when you, know, when you get more into like, the slasher stuff, it's more about like, oh, it's the girl. You know, or, right. But uh, the like, reason I think yeah. it's important simply is because, particularly in comics, which is a, med- and I would say mainstream comics, no less, it's just a medium not well known um, for showcasing and promoting strong female characters. What's interesting about horror as a genre is they, they have generally a plethora of strong female characters of one kind or another, uh, you know, from Jamie Lee Curtis to uh, Severny Weaver, uh, using the f- film examples. Um, you know, very different kinds of characters, but both the leads in their film. I'm actually always excited for it in, in horror, particularly, again, because it's one of the few mediums, I think, other than perhaps romance, where women... Um, can be strong, well-rounded, and fully formed. Like they don't—they don't necessarily have to be men in drag to be um, successful leading characters. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of fun with that. I feel like uh, it, one of the ideas was to try and invert that with American Vampire mm-hmm. in particular, so that the the heroine of the series is um, the monster. You know, she she's turned into the monster, and her boyfriend is human. You know, at the time, so she's sort of the the one out of control a lot of the time in that way, but. I don't. I, I I know what you're saying too, though. I mean, there's definitely there's a fine line. I think sometimes, like you know, as a boy growing up, a lot of the horror movies you watch, or at least a lot of them you'd get, I would get also because you know there's some female character that's going to be running around, you know, bad bad ones. Right. But then at the same time, you know, like something like Silence of the Lambs, I feel like is a complete inversion of that, where you know it's it's a testament to just great characterization, and you know does the opposite. So it's. Writing horror, I think, for us, like at least, or making, you know, American Vampire or The Wake has a female protagonist as well, is to just be careful not to, you know, objectify the lead and to make sure that the lead is someone that you feel you identify with and you're, you feel like a, a connection with because you feel at once they're a little more capable than you are, so that, you, like, thank God they're the one you're following because sure. they're going to get you out of this, you know? But at the same time that they're vulnerable enough that you feel like they, they could let you down, you know? Well, that's just good writing. <laughs> yeah. Although, but I, I, would, I would suggest that culturally, women are allowed those, allowed to be vulnerable more than men are, generally, um, in fiction. When people relate to that sort of stuff, women are often allowed a little bit more vulnerability because it's more culturally acceptable. Well, I think, I think that stereotype holds true. I mean, that's, it, it just, it is what it is. The culture is what it is. And right. I, I think some of that is still there, but I think people are, I think at least a lot of us, if I... I mean, I could speak for myself, try to move beyond it and make sure that that objectification isn't, you know, isn't present. But because I, I mean, I, I mean, the 80s is in terms of movies and women roles. I mean, that it wasn't exactly pretty all the time, or at least or at least what I, 
what I grew up with, yeah, in, in, horror, in horror. So, I mean, you know, seeing all these bad B movies and, like, throwaway characters, you know, like, when the ones, when ones stand out, I mean, it was, you know, it was a really, it was, it was a great, it was a great thing to see. I want to talk about process, so we're switching gears a little bit. Uh, and I want to know something really basic. I'm a freelancer. Uh, I work at home in a little studio, and I'm sort of curious, when you were writing or drawing, coloring your horror, where is it? Where do you do your work? But I think ev most, of, most of us do at home, right? Uh, I've seen, I know a couple of artists who actually, I will, they will bring their drawing pads to Starbucks, which always astounds me that they can work there. And because, because people now work on computers, there's a little bit more mobility, um, because they're, they're not worried about sort of spilling their ink and pens. I've seen people bring their syntax to, you know, other places, their pads. Uh, but I was curious about the, where you work, partly because I'm curious how much of it, in terms of environment, elicits horror. Is that something you have to get in the mood to do? I wish. I wish I'd on? go up to like the attic and there was like a lantern. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and I'd, look, I'd wear like a cloak. <laughs> um, but no, I were, I were, I mean, I, I think one of the fun things, maybe not fun, maybe this is just like a, tw a twisted thing, but you know, you in your head, like you, you figure out what scares you, and then you're. For me, the writing of the story actually takes less time than the conceiving of the. It's the same as outlining. Like a lot of people I know, outline and outline. I think of, I go over it in my head a lot. You know, and sometimes I do an outline, or sometimes I just think about it. But, you know, a lot of the time you find yourself thinking about it at the most inappropriate. Like I'll be at my kid's soccer game, you know, and you're like, you're like, oh, oh you know, like thinking about this horrible thing, and then they're like, oh, goal. And you're like, ah, uh, you know, or whatever. But, um, you know, I think. Part of the fun, or one of the things if you're an aspiring writer out there, is you can't, I, I feel like you have to have a space, like you're saying, like a studio, but you also have to be able to just do it wherever you are in some way and not be, you know, intimidated by the fact but that you, don't, you can't have it be the perfect thing. You know what I mean? Like, otherwise you'll never finish anything, at least for me. Because I used to be like, I need to sit down in my office and have like four hours with like nothing interrupting it, nothing, just perfect. And then you have kids and it's like, well, you know, all right. over the house. So you have to be able to say, I'm going to think of horrible things while I'm driving my kids to school and work on it, you know? Or at I'm least I do. I, don't, I feel like terrible now that I'm like... Well, no, well, no actually, I have, I, have, I have two daughters as well and, and I end up, especially driving, like passing stuff, people driving bad, you know, the, the flash goes through your head and you're just like, <laughs> yeah. I'm driving, I'm driving, don't get in a crash. You know, stop, stop thinking about this thing coming through the windshield. But, it, but I think in terms of that, I mean, I, I th in creativity, I think the, the whole, uh, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, uh, what's it called? The, yeah, Mute, read my mind. Inspiration? Thank you. Muse? Uh, language. Um, <laughs> no, like, uh, um, were you going through like a test trial? Oh, good God, I'm blanking. What's the uh, simulator? I, th I think like the, the, thank you. It's like Muse. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. I, th I think for this, I think uh, like fear is fear, I think, and especially like as a parent or even just imagining like daydreaming is like a great simulator for things that we can't attain or things that we don't want to happen in order to kind of deal with, with that fear or imagining these things of what they would look like or how you would react. That's, and then, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, so I mean, the, like, I, I kind of freaked out too about the little kid stuff, but it, it becomes kind of comforting because then it won't happen. Do you guys feel this way at all? Like, uh, any of you guys? Like, for me, I feel like it's really important to make horror out of the stuff that scares you personally the most. So, yeah. like, Severed, or, or for that book, is like, like I said, it's about a guy who goes around stealing and eating little kids, and I, I were writing it while we were pregnant with our second kid. Um, you know, and to be able to go there, you know, is important because it's it feels visceral and real. But then I can't watch anything about the same thing, or I I'm not because I'm writing it. I mean, I can't watch anything to this day. I, I can't stand watching things where little kids get attacked or whatever. But I can write about it all day. You yeah, know what I mean? Like, have you and seen the movie not the be children? bothered. No. Oh, I because what happens if the children are the attackers? Oh, if they're the little monsters, is that okay? That's just like life. Okay. <laughs> like all day long, they are. Are there things that have to be drawn, colored, um, have to be present visually to make something horror? Oh my God. Um, well, I think one of the big things that you always forget, like when you're drawing a horror comic, is that there's no sound. So that's a huge element of movies and you know radio dramas and <laughs> stuff like that that will put you in the mood you know the creaking door the the music the soft music 
you know, and then the loud bang or whatever. Um, you don't have that in comics, but in comics you have things that, um, elements that movies don't have. I think when you watch a movie, um, you are, your audience is captive and they're, they have to watch it at the speed that you're, you filmed it at, um, unless they are you know, watching a DVD and they pause it or whatever. But uh, with the comic, they have the choice to go backwards or forwards or skim it or you know, reread it. Um, you know, there's, so, so I think uh, audience manipulation can work a little bit differently with comics. And we have things like the page turn so that also yeah. my shape, favorite shape thing. Shape of the panels. <laughs> yeah, shape of the panels. Make, make the reader uh, read it through differently. Yeah, faster, I think smaller panels yeah. like would indicate like a staccato or like... A skyline or something. Yeah. And then the page turn is really important because, you know, you, you're reading and you're reading, and then I, um, as I don't, I mean, if if you're reading, ideally, I would like the reader to feel scared to turn the page, but it's something that you have to physically do. It's not like in a movie, you don't have to physically do anything to experience the story, but with a comic, you actually have to turn the page, kind of like a book. Yeah. Um, so the page turn is a really great way to give you that, like, you know, that scare. I think comics. Sean, <laughs> any thoughts? Actually, I, have a, I admit I've I've never turned a page in a comic and been scared. Me like either. I've just that's ever. ideally that would be the like when you're yeah. when you're drawing it though. Do you ever think like on the page turn this is gonna happen? Yeah, and, like I plan it, and I'm gonna but scare I just everybody. <laughs> that they're not. It's not gonna resonate. Like I do it because I know that that's how stories should be told, yeah. and that's one of our, like you said. Well, maybe one day we'll get it right. Maybe. <laughs> no, <I'm not> <laughs> you too. You just put a little. Sound He's gonna figure it out. Yeah. I'm not scared. <laughs> um, it's. I, I have to say, like it's. It's. I find drawing horror. I've only done it a couple times. Uh, difficult for this reason. I don't find comic art horrifying. Like I'm not. When I read a story in a comic, perhaps because of the process. I am never trembling in fear. Um, and I'm not sure why that is. I'm not sure if because now certainly I'm too aware of process. Um, so I'm aware of the page turn and I know the mechanics of that. So I'm like, oh, the writer and artist put this here hmm. to make me turn the page. I just might be too old for it. But even sort of famous, uh, the original Swamp Thing, which everyone sort of holds up as a great horror comic, I never walked away from it feeling afraid or I, I understood why it was to some people, but there's something about my relationship to ink on paper that, that kept me from being truly horrified, if that makes any sense. Do you think that's because the artist, even if they are trying to make something horrible or terrifying, there's still the goal to make it appealing, um, right? Like part, you still want it to be... I think so. Part of it also might be, I don't know how you guys feel about this, it was another, gonna be another question, uh, about things like um, uh, graphic depiction, like how explicit is uh, actually, something yeah. is versus something implied, right. color. And I do think I, um, I, I'm a, a, a 80s child, and so uh, I was weaned on 80s horror, and so things like sound are particularly important to me. Um, also, this is, and this goes to the question, I will just stop babbling, about visuals. And so, one of the things that's interesting about writing, uh, uh, reading a book, is we create visuals in our head. But when we are creating, drawing horror, we are cementing on the page, kind of like a film or TV show, what that horrible thing is. So I was sort of curious if you'd ever faced the artist, particularly a design challenge, or even, even uh, the other creators, um, about, holy shit, this has got to be the most scary thing ever. What is that going to look like? How am I going to commit that to the page? I don't think you can draw the scariest thing ever, um, just with the limitations of art. You know, if you're, you know, the big reveal is like a severed head, there's a chance that it might come out looking kind of silly, <laughs> right. you know? Um, and this is a big thing, I'm gonna bring it back to Lovecraft, and a lot of anthologies and stuff are coming out with his uh, short stories, which are, you know, short stories are great to adapt, but then it, it's always that the matter of like, and then he looked up in the sky and saw this thing and it made him go crazy. Well, you're never gonna be able to draw something that's gonna make somebody actually go crazy. So then you're forced with this dilemma is that anything I draw is not going to be as scary as anything that you guys could imagine. So I think in a, a lot of times uh, with comics, it's like, for me, I try to show less because I know that, um, you know, I try to do things that are voyeuristic um, and make, um, I, I, I shoot, I don't shoot for horror. I shoot for like uncomfortableness and like mm. creepiness. 
because I, I feel like that I can accomplish that. And if I was going to shoot for horror and really try to scare somebody, I don't, I don't necessarily know if I could. Um, actually, Emily Carroll's short comic, uh, His Face All Red, which you can actually read online for free, is probably the only comic that really, like, after I put it down, I was like, oh, that is so scary. Like, yeah. I, was, I was pretty scared after I read that. I don't also, know if you guys read that. Uh, maybe if you have to draw, like, the scariest thing in the world, uh, nothing you draw will be compared with the imagination of the reader, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so the best thing you can do is suggest. Uh, so I think the, the best horror storytelling lies in, in between the panels, actually, mm -hmm. not in the, in the actual drawing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think trying to, trying to disturb the reader, you know, and, yeah. like, get, get inside their head and have them do Creep. the work. Yeah. You know, enough to tease and taunt them and not, not give them everything. Because when you give them everything, I mean, it just, it, you, you know. You can't give them everything. Yeah, I mean, the, I, th I think. They don't want everything. <laughs> there's, there's some limitations to the form and the format, I, I, I think. But those limitations can be uh, invaluable. But like, it, I, I, yeah, but, you, but used in the, in the right in way. In the right way. I, th I think that's, that's kind of what we all kind of strive for is like how far can we push this in, in order to really kind of engage the viewer and actually tell the story. But I, I have to agree with Sean, I, I, and I'm guessing the uh, rest of us. I mean, I, I haven't really read a comic and been, you know, horror, you know, like scared. But I've, I've read, I've read stories and been completely disturbed, or couldn't finish them, you know. So I mean, it, I think, I think that that's when things like start to pull off and the genre starts to really kind of have an effect. And maybe horror is uh... more about disturbing than frightening, if that makes any sense. Maybe it's about walking away feeling disturbed as opposed to feeling afraid. And I remember being scared by comics as a kid, like Creep Show, like you know, the, with the Bernie Wrightson illustrations mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Like genuinely scared, or Tales from the Crypt, you know, and that stuff. I think part of it is that, like, one of the only things you have with comics is that you know that someone's reading it in private. Like it's a private mm -hmm. experience as opposed to watching a movie in a theater, which is very fun to be scared with other people. But that's why I think it's scary if you're writing a story or drawing a story and you know it's, it's literature, you know, for me, the scariest stuff, it leaves, you, it leaves you unsettled in this kind of ambiguous way where you, you, you're not sure you're safe, you know, or that kind of something might creep out and that sense of, like, you know, a, a, so a character, it's not so scary that you see the character and he's terrifying, but it can be, you know, you see the right art. I, I do think, you know, the monsters that we, he puts up in American Vampire and the creatures or whatever... A lot of the time I see it and I'm like, that's pretty scary, you know? But what it is is it's the experience, I think, if, as a writer or an artist, you know that the person is reading it alone. And you keep that in mind, you know? They're probably reading it alone in their house or somewhere by themselves. Right. And you play those fears up. Like, you know, the character saying to another character, oh, you know, uh, you, uh, you, um, you thought you were rid of me, but, you know... I've been hiding under your bed the whole time and I've listened to you at night while you're asleep and I hear that you have this cough and, you know, tonight while you're there, you know, like all that kind of stuff, it's creepy because then you put the book down you're by yourself, you know, and you're like, oh. As opposed to the kind of like big stomping, you know, monster stuff, I think, in that way, if you can get under people's skin because you know they're reading it in private. Right. That, that to me is, yeah, a priority, I guess, with it. Yeah, I just, I've, I've always wondered, or at least like approaching horror, I mean, I guess I'll throw this to you guys, I wonder if, I wonder if it takes a level of, of imagination and trust, you know, like naive, you know, being naive at a certain age. Because I remember things at a certain age just living on and on and on, and I couldn't get rid of them, you know. But at a certain age, it's, you know, like you see somebody like, that is scary, but you're not, you know, it's like I'm not, I'm not really affected, but like, that, that is scary, you know. And I, the first thing that pops in my mind is like, if I were a kid, that would scare the shit out of me. You know, but like as an adult, it's like, well, that's pretty, that's awesome, that's scary, but I'm, I'm not really, I'm not really affected by it. But then, you know, the story, when the story comes together, it's like, that is a really scary story, but just verbalizing it kind of <laughs> demystif, you know, it's like, right. de takes you out of it, like demystifies it, like when you close the book. Yeah. Well, I think it's easier when you're a kid to be scared yeah. by like a shock or those things scare you more as an adult, like leaving you unsettled about the particulars of the things that are real or your sense of safety or control mm -hmm. over things, leaving you with not sure of things is really scary. Yeah. You know, like I don't go to see like Insidious or whatever to be like, I go there for fun, you know? Yeah. Even though they're kids or teenagers that you think like they're gonna leave and be like, oh shit, that was really scary. I'm going home and like, I can't sleep. I think it's more like as an adult, you see something where a child is taken or those things, you know, or 
I don't know. And they leave you unsettled about the safety of things and in that mm -hmm. way that are open-ended. Do you know what I mean? Like there's something about the horror movie also like the detective story that often closes down the, closes down everything scary. You know, mm -hmm. it's like a closed set. Whereas the scariest ones leave that open-ended kind of ambiguity. That something I think just sparked, an um, and then I want to get to the next question. I was watching the movie The Descent for the mm -hmm. first, uh, I've seen it many, many times, but with uh, someone who had not seen it. And two things struck me. Um, one was, once the monsters were revealed, he wasn't really interested. What terrified him was the idea of being trapped or buried yeah. alive, like being in a cave and having no way out. And I thought that was really amazing, because that's generally what's one of my great fears. But the, the fact that once the reveal of what was ha hunting them, he was sort of like in it, but not really. But in the moments where they're trying to navigate this cave system and they can't get out, he was like gripped and silent through the whole thing. And I just thought that was uh, interesting about what we're afraid of and what is horrifying as opposed to just what's kind of the, 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 the sort of scary monster under the bed. Um, two other quick questions. I wanted to find out something about color, <coughs> particularly in art and how important color is to creating mood and horror. Um, if you guys have any thoughts on that. Um, yeah, well, there's, there's a sequence I drew for American Vampire that I selected especially because of the color. Uh, so in this in the scene, Pearl is kind of looking for for she's looking for someone. <laughs> I don't really remember any time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she's kind of looking for someone, and the tension is growing. And you can follow that through the colors. Uh, can you go back for the first one, please? It's a three-page thing. Yeah. Right. Right here? See, it's a very light yellow in the sky and uh, a big landscape. So, so that was built to, to, to make the reader kind of look for something as well. It's, it's like a double spread. Yeah, it's top. a double spread. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, so imagine to that together. Yeah, got it. And then it gets darker and more red as you go like that. So once, once she finds him, uh, you can notice that the, the yellow uh, start to become uh, uh, or an orange, mm -hmm. start to get warmer and warmer, and then, you can flip please. The next page? Yeah, we have a big reveal, and see how, how, the, whole, how the whole sequence of, of fighting and tension uh, go gets uh, more and more red. Yeah. Yep. So that's great coloring. And was that for your instruction? Did no, you? not at all. That was just the color. That's Dave McKee. Okay. He's, he's like the best. That's, that's 33 issues of working together. <laughs> right. yeah. uh, I'm just sort of curious <coughs> how interactive, in terms of creating horror comics, how collaborative you all are. Do you talk with the people you work with? I find I rarely talk with anyone I work with. Um, I get a script, and that's usually the last I hear from anybody, and to, except for my editor. Really? Do you? Oh yeah, I never uh, talk to anybody. Um, do you? Because <laughs> you don't want to. What? Because you don't want to. Uh, I don't reach out, but it's also I think the people I work with. Like I think it's the way they work. Um, like they, you know, I get bits and pieces of script whenever they get a chance to write it, and then I just kind of generate it and get it in. And um, uh, I per it's been a long time since I've actually collaborated with anyone, but it's, again, I think it's the people I'm working with. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious how often you guys actually work with and talk to the people that you work with. Yeah, we talk, we talk a, lot. a lot. Yeah. 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 It's, I it's, talk with my editor. I don't mean that. I mean, like, the other creative people on the... Oh. Uh, 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 well, we, we talk a lot. Uh, I don't talk that much with Dave, but every time we do, it's kind of... Uh, because the thing is that I don't like to interfere that much in his process. Right. So I like, even if I sometimes don't like a page or here or there, it's, it's his stuff, you know? Unless it's important for the story, I won't say anything. Uh, but yeah, he, he just do it right all the time. So I don't, don't even have to say much. Do you, and you have a lot of interaction with Matt, too, on the wake, I feel like. Yeah. Um, yeah, with Mike, I'm the same way. I, uh, maybe there's a page every now and then that I'm not thrilled with, but that's his job, and yeah. he doesn't tell me how to draw. 
I'm sure I give him pages exactly. that he's not thrilled with. It's, you know, it is what it is. So it's disturbing that you don't talk to your team more. I, I talk to hard. my, <laughs> I, I talk to my editor usually in that's hard. the past, <laughs> yeah, the past several years, my point person has always been my editor. Yeah. That's who I usually communicate with. It's that, what that says is every comic that comes out isn't as good as it could be because there's always <laughs> something lost in translation. If, if people aren't communicating strongly, like if you had a better idea of what your writer was really after with these characters, that might help you do your job uh, a little bit differently. And um, I just worry that there's so many comics that they don't communicate. Like it's like they separate us on purpose, whatever, just to keep it as a uh, assembly line of some kind. Um, I would add conversely, I think, and this is not important for the, but it's also just a matter of trust. Yeah. Um, the writers I work with now, they know that I'm not going to try to screw them over. I'm not going to be uh, like what they're going to give me. They're going to they're going to get. Oh, okay, I thought oh, I didn't know that. Um, so I I think a lot of it is they're like oh he knows what he's doing and I unless I have a really important question I take it sort of as a as a compliment. Um, I just find I don't do a lot of I I tend to collaborate more with my colorist than I do with my writer um, and my editor I talk to all the time generally um, okay. but. Yeah, I don't. Ha I've, I, it's been years since I have a relationship with a writer. Yeah. Um, well, out of DC, there must be. I don't know if you can say, but the DCU, for example, versus how Vertigo works. My experience with DCU is uh, very rarely did I ever speak to my editor or the writer. It was almost like we, they were we were sectioned off on purpose for some reason. Well, I think every collaboration is different, and I, I can't speak to how anyone else works at DC. I just know how I work, and what I know is that I I like to put people in touch if they if they want to be in touch or if they don't want to be in touch like let's let's find that rhythm and then keep that rhythm you going. put me in touch with Jordi Belair for the American Vampire right. short I did and she's awesome um, so and then uh, we both had like no notes yeah no notes <laughs> it was great but I, I gave her when when you told me um, you know when you said to work you know Jordi wants to work with you I said okay and then Jordi asked me if there was any notes that I had before she started. So I gave her all the color notes that I thought in my head. Right. And it came back like even better than I could have ever imagined. Yeah. And it was like this perfect. Yeah. Um, but it was like any time, like the whole story takes place over the course of like a day, I think. So it starts at night and then gradually gets warmer and brighter until it fades down into darkness again. And she captured that, like, that arc perfectly. Yeah. And I find the couple of things I did with horror coloring this thing that I always, because I love to let colorists just play, because invariably, I, not unlike you, I will get more amazing results than if I do heavy art direction. But the two times I've done horror, um, the colors were so bright and so pastel -y, I was generally shocked um, mm. at, at just that approach. And I'm assuming it was my artwork elicited that response. Um, but it just wouldn't have occurred to me in a horror book to go so bright. And I was always a little surprised by that. Uh, um, I wanted to ask you, Mark, specifically, before we go open up to questions, um, going back to the original thing about story, and that's about story and a good story, is uh, um, in terms of um, writing submissions, I guess starting at the top, uh, story, what, do you have any triggers as an editor where you're like, I love that, I want to do that? Are there certain kinds of stories, particularly pertaining to horror, that you like more than others, i.e., I love zombie <coughs> stories, but I hate giant mo Godzilla stories? <coughs> I love all those things. Yeah, even better. <laughs> um, I think you're always looking for something. There's no such thing as a new story until you tell it, right? So, especially when Scott came to me with American Vampire, it's like, I mean, vampires were very big at the time in a very different way, though. So, when he pitched me that and he said, this is, I remember the sign specifically, we have a chance here to create a new kind of vampire, an American vampire. And that was the line that was in the pitch that ended up becoming the title. Um, and that was exciting to me because I, yes, I'd seen all these elements before, but it's how do you put these elements together in, in a new way and tell me that and tell me that up front um, so that I, 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 then I'm on board and then we talk about the best way to sort of, you know, pace those pieces out. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's the, the, the... And and practically, do you prefer to read pitches or hear them, or does it matter? Uh, I prefer to get an email mm -hmm. with a, just a few lines, a paragraph saying, hey, 
are you interested in a giant robot story with a dog? And then I could be like, no, I'm already working on one of those. Right. <laughs> um, working on three of them. Yeah, three. <laughs> I can't choose which one's the best. Um, but then after that, on the phone and talking about, you know, well, what makes this work and, and what makes you the most excited about this story? Let's drill down to that. And right. And go from there. Sweet. Um, do you guys have questions? Uh, for Scott, uh, first of all, congratulations on the stretch goal for In the Dark on, on Kickstarter, getting uh, your own tail Thank in there. You. Um, I want to know what uh, interested you in the project and what you're excited about, and uh, as well as uh, on a slight tangent, opening up the question to everybody, uh, what you think of Kickstarter as a launching platform for, for these comics uh, and for giving some genres that maybe don't have as much love in the mainstream a chance to shine. And I, I love Kickstarter. I think it's great. I mean, I, I wish they had these things when I was younger as well, you know. In, in a lot of ways, I, I came in more conventionally in that way, and it's thrilling to see. I have a lot of students who now are former students who now have comics through Kickstarter and stuff like that. And he was asking what attracted me. There's a horror anthology I'm going to be in um, called uh, In the Dark. Yeah. Rachel Deering. Yeah, that's right. It's a Rachel Deering one. I was through Kickstarter. It's called In the Dark. And I think part of it was like... Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, a lot of my friends were in it. <laughs> and I read some of the pitches for the stories, and I thought they were really good. And then I was, I, I guess sometimes I get, I get a little bit, because, um, you know, Superman and Batman, you write everything like a horror story, I think, deep down. If, you know, for me, I mean, I do. Because like, I always love stories where people are really faced with, like, the fear that something is true about themselves that they don't want to admit somehow. And you attack them on that level. So, like, for Batman, you attack him. You don't really love your family. You love your villains, you know? Or for Superman, you're just a coward because you won't really do the things you want to do and change the world and you're hiding. And you do that, and I think you bring personal demons to life. So it is kind of like, for me, it's, there's no difference. Like, that's where the horror comes from in horror as opposed to the monsters, you know? Like, in American Vampire, a lot of the time, or in The Wake, the monsters are fun, you know? The horror comes from... The personal fears that come to life, am I a bad mother, or am I going to die without saying goodbye to my child, or did I screw this up so badly that you know everyone I love is now in a trap somewhere underground, and all of those kinds of fears are the real fears. Um, so I just wanted to do something that was really scary and really dark. So the thing in there that I'm doing is like severed kind of dark about a little kid, so it should be fun. I don't want to give it away. Yeah, Declan is going to be amazing, Declan Shelby. Hi, um, Scott. I think you talked about for being influenced by Stephen King, and everybody talked about like you, know, you were saying that you're an '80s child, so that's a big, a big influence. Is there anything that was like kind of like out of the ordinary? Like I remember um, a, a, an episode of Buffy like really impacted me. Like I, I found it really scary, which was Hush, where like these monsters came in and and silenced everybody, so nobody could scream. And I just found that kind of strange that it was like such a campy, like fun show, but that like really scared me because it was like it played on one of my fears. Is there anything like that that you found that has like influenced or inspired you that wasn't like necessarily from like your wheelhouse of like <coughs> Stephen King or 80s like flicks or anything like that that you pulled from in your in your uh, work? Yeah, I, I was, uh, and this is something we've talked about, Becca. I was a film student, so when I started to go back and really watch. Um, and, and these were horror movies, but like Nosferatu and M and uh, the Cabinet of uh, Dr. Caligari. Mm -hmm. These I never would have found these movies if I hadn't um, if I if I hadn't gone to film school. And so and, and these things really creeped me out in a way that the contemporary stuff that I had grown up on didn't didn't affect me. At I think all. it's like the limitations of the film, though. I mean, you got like very stark black and white. Yeah. Um, the way they would film it, like. Basically, everything I do, I just rip off Fritz Lang anyway. You right. know? Like, right. so. The secret is that. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you, actually, for, as part of the process, if you guys have a reservoir um, of, like, a place where you go to where you're like, I need inspiration. If you have a book or a film or a, a, even a photographer, say, that you go back to constantly um, for when you're, when you're stuck for inspiration. Do you guys have anything like that? Well, for me, it's film, and, and that's one thing I would say, too, especially to students and who are going to aspire to collaborate with people. Um, that's our shared vocabulary, especially when we're talking about stories. <coughs> oh, it's like in that, you know, and that's usually what sparks everything like that. But, um, yeah, in terms of going back to, again and again, I'm sure we all have, like, a list that's 
response? I think, I, yeah, I go back to them to look at the mechanics of them to try and figure mm -hmm. out. And that's one thing I would say don't be afraid of at all, either as an artist or a writer, is to take apart the things that you love or try and figure them out. Because to me, you, I don't know, like my wife's a doctor, and I always was like, how do you cut open, because she's a surgeon, which is awesome, because I call her up and like ask her science questions <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Where I'm always like, if Bruce Wayne got hit by a laser in his face, you know, and it's like, she's like, what? If, when? <laughs> you know? Yeah, but I'm like, you know science. And um, the the she, oh, she really, they're like holding it to her, you know? And she's like, anyway, but the thing is, um, I'm always sort of amazed, like, you go through gross anatomy and that stuff, and you're like, how do you not look at everyone and just see bodies and meat and that kind of stuff? And she's like, well, you, when you open the body up, and you see how wondrous it is, you know? And you see, there are all these mysteries that you explain, but there's still wonder. You can't figure out how, as you get smaller and smaller, how it's possible, you know? And that's what I would say, don't be afraid of like, not that your story is like a body, a dead body or whatever, or a living frog or whatever, but you know, don't be afraid of taking the things that you love the most and really trying to dissect them because there's always still the element of wonder in there. Like when you understand how, like when I, you know, reread Pet Cemetery or something like that, right, which is my favorite scary book of all time. You reread it and you think like, where is it making me scared? What is it that's doing it? Is it in the, la where in the language does it begin to turn? You know, or a comic, you wind up more inspired, I think. It doesn't take away from it, you know, in that way. So I go back to things like that, that when I'm, when I'm doing The Wake, I'll go back and see The Thing or The Abyss and, you know, Alien and that and look at that stuff and try and figure out how that works to try and put, put together the best horror I can. And one of the weird things is like, to answer your question from before, like, yeah, I totally remember like weird episodes of things that scared me to death. Like there was an episode of the Smurfs where like the Smurfs, no, I'm not even kidding. They, they had like, a, it was like a, they get bitten. Yeah, they, they get bitten and then they turn into the Smoofs. <laughs> yeah, they get bitten and it's like a disease. And they turn dark blue, and they're like, then they they're, they turn they're rabid. People. Yeah, rabid. <laughs> yeah. Rabbits first. And then there was another, there was like a, and it's weird because then there was like a little house on the prairie, this one with the guy with the, you know what I mean? And he comes after the blind sister with a thing. With uh, Anyway. Uh, I'm sure I saw it, yeah. <laughs> but the, well, the only reason I say is it's, uh, I remember because those things stay with you when it's like, you, you expect one thing, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. you're like watching it because it's like, oh, it's a little house on the prairie. There's Michael Landon and whatever. And then some dude in a corn sack mask with like a thing and you're like, ah! You Do know, you remember when they pushed Nelly down? When yes, yeah, that in was the wheelchair. The yeah, yeah, it's hilarious. Uh, as, a quick, as a quick aside to that too, another interesting thing to dissect um, is humor. Um, I was working on some humor projects a couple of years ago and although it can kill your favorite things, the things that make you laugh, uh, if you're not careful, it's really interesting to analyze what frightens you and what makes you laugh, and to really sort of pull them apart and figure out the parts. Um, uh, that, that laughter comedy is also really um, fascinating when you get down to it and when you start to sort of dissect the bits of it. Um, okay. Uh, so my question is mostly about uh, I guess, looking at a lot of the work that's uh, being projected, um, you don't see a, a lot of uh, panel or uh, 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 word bubbles, I guess, uh, that's going on. You don't see, um, like the art, like um, Tales of the Crypt and uh, the Tale of Horror, uh, those old magazines. I, I remember my mom was a, she was a, a librarian and the one magazine I used to check out was uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not, and it was like, I was the only one checking it out, but it was all comic book, you know, oriented. And, but the, the, it was all about the storytelling, and a lot of it was, you know, all over the board. And so a, a lot of it I see, like right now, is like action and anatomy and stuff like that. Um, when do you feel like um, it changed? You mean when did comics become less text dense? Yeah, less text dense. Yeah, yeah. Kind of crazy wordy. So I don't know. I feel like I'm pretty. I'm pretty text dense, you know, but myself. Yeah, some of those pages just don't. They have just. They just removed on. it. <laughs> yeah, but Th those do though. Oh, that does. Yeah, those, yeah, yeah, those do. Well, yeah, that does. Yeah, this is no, not right. as text dense as some of your stuff. I'm. I'm not sure. I, I wonder if maybe that was uh, style or or genre or time or or 
you know, like a stylistic thing for the writers in the yeah, format the like at the time. Film is shot, you know, you can yeah. tell you can tell a film from like the fifties from the from the right. 70s. Yeah. Dialogue is very mannered and things like that. I was thinking about this, I was looking at old issues of um uh, Claremont's Wolverine, and that stuff was in uh, an X Men. Obviously, is sort of most famous for that hyper um, dense text. I think there's a set. I, my guess is you guys might disagree. There's a sense that generally that's not particularly sophisticated. Um, one of the things I'm curious, I'm trying to figure out, is when the uh, thought balloon vanished, and when we when we left the omniscient narrator behind. I've been very curious about that. Like what because. As far back as 1988, 89, they started using the characters to narrate their own books. So the omniscient narrator vanished. So that's at <coughs> least what 25, you know, or 23 years ago. So um, it's been a while. My, but my guess is there was a sense that, uh, at least in American superhero comics, you know, when you're throwing a lightning bolt or running at the speed of sound, you don't have time to say a monologue about how your marriage is crumbling and. Um, you have to also, sign those divorce papers. Also, I think, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but in the old comics, uh, we can see a lot of, um, I mean, you see a lot of panels like, I'm walking in the street, and the person is walking in the street. I mean, <laughs> you know, a lot of things like that. And now I think maybe the, the reader is a bit more, more sophisticated too. I mean, I, I, just think, I just think it's something from the time it was natural at, at the point, but now... People are just more, more uh, feel more prepared, maybe, to connect the images with the the text. Well, the language is also evolving, and like our syntax yeah. and our the way we write and draw, but the way we read it too. I mean, now you have like a bigger range of comics than we've ever had before, and a lot of that's not just due to like, um, you know, it's the medium too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have like web comics and like the infinite canvas and. You know, a lot of people self-publishing, and you're able to do all sorts of sorts of crazy stuff. Linking it back to film for a minute too. Um, uh, early earlier film, particularly this what, stuff with a really mannered speech, it's a very sort of romantic, um, non-realistic. It's a fantastical approach to reality, um, and I think um, you know eventually that fell to the wayside. I think that's happened in comics too. It's just a theory of mine that. The sort of fantastical, the romantic, and I mean romantic not in terms of love, but um, sort of as kind of like the artistic movement, that's sort of frowned upon because it's not real, it's not true, um, you know, and in our constant search to get to like the truth or the heart of the matter, like if people would really do this in real life. I think that sort of the, the, the fantastical, the romantic, the, uh, what do I want to say, effusive has sort of um, evaporated uh, um, as, as seen as, uh, what's, the, what's the word, unnecessary, or that, that's just a theory I have. Um, particularly, I, I'm really fascinated by film only because I think about the, the language of certain old movies, which is unrivaled um, in anything I, I see today, um, but people don't talk like that. But then you're watching a movie, it's not real. People never, because uh, people can talk like that in a film because it's, it's not real. But there's a sense that this material and the material that we're watching has to reflect our reality. And since people don't banter like that, and you know, you know uh, I think my sense is that it has, it has gone to the wayside. I'd love to see some of it come back, quite frankly. I'm not good with public speaking, so just bear with me. Um, I find myself more disturbing is things that like you read or see in a movie or whatever, things that can actually happen. Like when I saw the original Last House on the left, that's one movie I literally can never see again because I saw that and it was just like, that can actually happen, you know? And then you see like these monster movies or, you know, supernatural things and you think to yourself most of the times just that can't happen. So I was wondering what you guys thought on that. What would be more disturbing to you? Uh, I guess for me right now, reality is, you know, and, and psychological play and, you know, in, Getting the getting the viewer to empathize with something immediate and real, uh, at least right now, seems very much more frightening than um, the threat of Pacific Rim. <laughs> um, as awesome as I accepted that movie is, even though it has amazing holes. Um, but you know, I I don't know. I I would imagine personal preference of the of the time. Did anybody see that viral video? Uh, 
to promote Carrie, it, like oh, just yeah. last week. Yes, or something. Yeah. amazing. The girl in the coffee shop who flips out and like has these TK powers. Have you guys, and she's, like, who has not around. seen it? Go Google it. Not yes. now. Uh, Later, it's it's but fantastic. It's Carrie, amazing. <coughs> and she like coffee they, shop. They set up this coffee shop to so that if someone spills a coffee on her laptop, and she flips out and like throws this dude against the wall and she's like blowing all the tables away and everything and they show the reactions of the people in the shop who were like, oh my God, and they're like so terrified. I watched this and I was like, I would be so excited. So excited. I would be like, so yes! excited. <laughs> Finally. Right. I have to tell you. Call Professor X. I knew this yes, was going to yes, happen. Yes. This I is, knew it. This is my big issue, I think, generally with the idea of mutants being feared and hated as a yeah, convention. I'm like, way, that's man. awesome. Yes. Like, I want to see Superman yes. fly around. I'm not terrified yes. of that idea. Yeah. You should definitely uh, check this out. The, uh, some social effects people rigged this coffee shop. Um, and the reactions are, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's hilarious. It's hilarious. And a wonderful but, promotional idea, I think. Oh, totally, no. And then I, like, it was done, and I was like, oh, man, that was an ad. Come yeah. Damn. But I, I do think that the, the fantastic, it's not as scary as the, as the, as the more. No. Movies. Well, I think you can flip it, though. I mean, to me, I totally understand. Like, I think um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the movie for me that was like, yeah. that scared me to death. And then I saw, I was like, totally primed from my video stop library <laughs> not to be scared of things. And I was like, oh, I, I, you know, I'm going to rent this old stupid movie, Night of the Living Dead. Mm -hmm. And that scared me worse than any movie ever. And I don't know what it was, except it's the slow march, the terror that things are coming and you can't reason with them or stop them. And then the flip, I think, that the human, the, the fallibility of the characters is what makes it horrifying, meaning like that they can't, get it together. So I think it's not so much the zombies are really scary and your daughter turning into a zombie and having a spade in the basement and you, the terror of that coming, is, I think is viscerally can be terrifying. But I think the trick with those is that the thing that's always scary is the, the human failure, I guess, somehow, both in, like in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the failure of empathy, the fact that they don't care and they just keep coming and that you just wind up back in the same nightmare and they'll... They have no, you can't reason with them, and that's what's scary about a serial killer or that kind of thing, that they, there's absolutely no humanity there, and they're not going to listen. They're going to be gleeful as they kill you. Whereas I think the supernatural horror, and again, like Stephen King to me, like a lot of the best stuff is like if you, the mist or whatever, it's the people turn on each other, and it's terrifying because there's a scary thing that precipitates that, or Cujo or whatever. It brings out, it brings out your own sense of, I, I'm not going to make it out of this. I'm going to die because I'm not good enough somehow to overcome this. And that is, can be deeply terrifying too, I that's think. A, that's the thing that's freaky <coughs> about mobs and like fire drills. Like yeah, fire, fire drills, drills. as a kid <laughs> freaked me out. Man. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just how <laughs> mass people, right? There's the exit. Everybody's going for it. Right, people over getting other. trampled. You know, um, the, the, I'm always the, afraid in Comic Con the <laughs> that that's going to happen. The stroller, the stroller totally. down the staircase. Like if I this know, broke, it, you know, if zombies broke out, it would how be, many of us are going to make it out these two exits? Uh, you, were, you know, how many bodies are just going to be like, oh, my arm, you know, like just laid out on the floor? Um, as, a, as an aside, um, I am teased a lot by friends who know that when I'm home and working late at night, I tend to watch a lot of Discovery ID, which are like these terrible true crime <laughs> recreations. Um, I shouldn't have opened the, the door. Channel. What? The murder, the murder channel. channel. But part of it, I was just actually watching a story last night. The abridged version is a woman kidnapped randomly by some guy who came in, had seen her, decided that he wanted her. Uh, he shot her husband dead, took her, kept her for 48 hours, raped her. Um, he, when he went to work, I mean, it was really, I guess, seen out of a movie. Apparently, uh, she was able to get out of bed, call 911, and get help. And it was this horrific, like, she watched the news reports of her husband's, um, uh, she watched news reports of people reporting her husband died. Like, that's how she even knew he, he had been shot. I'm thinking, this is a true story. Here's this woman recounting it, police officers telling this tale. I'm like, that's far scarier to me than any episode of The Walking Dead. I've ever watched, and I, I tend to find those true crime things, aside from the fact I'm a terrible crime writer, I'm awed at the way um, people think and the sort of, uh, both the barbarism people are capable of and the heroism as well. Um, you, you, we were just, I wanted to bring this back a little bit too and kind of connecting it with this. Um, you talked about the 
Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Have you seen the making of? No. It's like scarier than the film because of the situation that they were in, everyone was like, it was boiling hot and it was frustrating and like none of the special effects were working and like that scene at the dinner table when he cuts his hand, it's actually cut, you know, it's like <laughs> stuff like that. Like huh. the idea that this film was like, you know, made under such stressful circumstances almost makes you understand how creepy the film is. Oh yeah. It's really weird, but yeah, the, the, the fact that it was like the real, if you haven't seen it, you gotta watch it, it's ridiculous. Mm. I'm not for boundaries. I just think it's taste, you know? I mean, in terms of, you know, you, it, once it's not scary for you, it's not horror, you know, in that way. And for me, it's, it has to be something that's disturbing for me personally, or I don't like it. So to write, I mean, so, you know, horror is that. I mean, I, I would write about horrifying things with children or a horrifying father or those things. And that you have to, I just, you have to do that, I feel like, or it's not, at least for me, I do, or it's not visceral. So I wouldn't want anyone to put any restrictions on how dark it could go, you know, because it could go, <clears throat> I want it to be as scary as possible. You know, if you're talking about like gore and sensationalism and stuff, that's, I just think you just, for me, I'm not up for censoring any of that stuff. It's more just if you just don't read it. Like I don't, you know, and you let it die on the vine, you just don't even, you know what I mean? If it's something offensive, so. I, I too, generally, I, I'm not particularly for boundaries. I think boundaries need to be pushed and broken. I just know as I get older though, I'm keenly aware that of that I have responsibility when I put material out in the world. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm gonna put something out there that's horrific or gory or that has imagery that uh, could be, you know, boundary pushing, um, I just sort of need to own it. Um, and I just I'm as I get older and maybe it's discovery ID, I just sort of realize that uh, I want to put stuff out there that is worth the paper it's printed on. Um, if it's going to shock, I would like it to shock for a reason, mm -hmm. um, other than just be like, yeah, I did it. I, I'm not much of a fuck you writer. Um, maybe I should be more, but uh, I'd like to believe that stuff comes out and there, that there's an underpinning to it um, beyond just shock for shock's sake. Yeah, I think you have to think if you're pushing, when you're pushing boundaries, like how are you pushing them and why are you pushing them? And if you can kind of justify those. And then there's that whole, like, you know, write what you know. Mm -hmm. In which case, if we all wrote what we knew, we'd just be writing, like, autobiographies. But I think that even in horror, if you're writing something like, you know, The Mire, this short story that I did is about, like, a haunted castle in a swamp, you know? But there's also, like, underlying themes of family and, like, you know, mm -hmm. things, things like that that I would, you'd string through it, like, things that I know and understand and things that I've had feelings that I've had, you know, or things that I've gone through. And you try and just stick that in there in subtle ways. And then, you know, by the time you're finished, it has nothing to do with your life anymore and it has nothing to do with you, but you still put yourself in there in a way that no one will know, but I think it makes it more real uh, for the reader, mm -hmm. just being based on something like a real feeling. So if you're just writing something with no feeling there, then what's the point? What's the point? Really? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, what I would say is like just one thing is for me, I try and make it really personal. So, you know, if something scares you, like I tried to figure out like what is it that's so scary about Night of the Living Dead to me, right? It's probably the cruelty or the hopelessness of that movie that they have like every stereotype that usually survives the movie and they don't. Sorry, spoilers. If you haven't seen it, it's from like 1962, <laughs> but whatever. Um, you know, and that, that, it's horrifying. You see the young couple burned and eaten and you see each, each thing, you know, and that, that, Hopelessness, and so you, for what I'd say is try and figure out what what you find scary. If you find something scary, and then you build on that. For me, with Batman, I mean, the only way or Superman, the only way you can write them, I feel like, is to try and figure out what what you think is a great strength, and it's also something that could be seen as a, as an Achilles heel, and then you go for it like the worst villain in the world. So, but those things have to be personal. So for me, for example, and then I'll shut up, but like for Joker, right, for the Joker story we did, or for Court of Owls. I mean, Court of Owls is about growing up in the city, for me, you know, here. And that it's, I always, uh, I always, or better yet, for horror, I guess, Joker. I thought of Joker again when we were, we were pregnant. And uh, I was thinking Batman has this big extended family, 
and isn't, you know, I was thinking to myself, like, God, I'm about to have another kid, and what if I'm a terrible dad this time, and am I ready for this? And God, I wish I could just stop worrying about this other kid for like two seconds, you know? And then I'm like, oh, well, Batman must once in a while think, I wish I could stop worrying about my family, my Bat family for a while. And then I was like, oh, well, someone, some villain would be like, I just heard you say you just wanted your whole family dead. Let me help you with that, you know? And that would be the Joker. And that, that's where you get into it. But those fears, the anxieties in that story are my anxieties, you know? And that's how you get in. That, I, there's no, like Mark said, there's no new stories, you know, in some ways. But the only way to make them new is to make them intensely personal because it's not, to me, you put yourself on the page and you're individuated. There's nothing, there's nothing that can make it not original if it's about your own deeply personal nightmares. I mean, the same, Court of Owls is about, like, growing up on the Lower East Side and always wondering what, the generations of people that lived in the apartment before me because you can know every inch of that apartment but you can't know who lived there before in every way and so what if there's a batman knows gotham but he doesn't really know the lives lived there what if you create a horror a horror coming for him from those crevices he can't explore and that was the idea you know so you do that you try and think what's scary to what what do you see as a strength in the character that interests you that you also see, well, what's the flip side as a weakness, that you can really tear them apart, you know, psychologically and emotionally in a way that's, that's, that's uh, powerful for you personally. I hope that makes sense. Well, I think as an editor, we're talking about pitches before and stuff like that, if someone were to come to me and say, yeah, I know The Walking Dead kind of zombie is huge, but what if it were this kind of zombie and sort of pushed it in a different direction and found some, some route that we haven't really talked about or explored before? Or it, I, that would be interesting to me. I, I don't think it's dead, but I think the person who figures out the way to do it um, could be very successful. <laughs> hmm. That's just like, that's just... <laughs> that's no like, more questions. Yeah. We have work That's today. like the nature of, of monsters, though, is they evolve with us. So, you know, we're talking about zombies have this evolution, vampires have this evolution, where before they were used to explain disease, then Bram Stoker got a hold of it. And I think, you know, in Bram Stoker's Dracula, which is kind of the definitive modern vampire, he was, he was definitely talking about things like syphilis and, you know, STDs that they may not have understood, but are... You know, that's definitely an underlying theme of, of Dracula. And now it's, they're sparkly and they're totally different. You know, there's this, they, we've taken some of this, uh, the mysticism that used to be involved in vampires and we've kind of taken it away because we don't, we understand that stuff now. So there's no reason to mystify disease or death uh, or, you know, uh, decay of the body. Um, and so we and so we take it, and it it definitely becomes a lot sexier now. Be that we it's like, oh, okay, well now let's, you know, it's a different angle. And the same thing with zombies, I think. And I think the next logical step is there's going to be a new, you know, in 20 years or 10 years or something, someone's going to make a new zombie, and it's going to define zombie for the next generation, because that's what we're doing. We're like storytellers. We're redefining, uh, you know, stories that are told over and over. Because like you said, like nothing. There's no original stories, I guess. You just take things and you retell it for the next generation, which is... Right, uh, just talk about a little bit of transformation. I'm, we sort of all know, myths sort of evolve to you know, deal with the, the thoughts, concerns <coughs> of the, the culture that's using them, which is why myths generally aren't stagnant. Uh, it strikes me, and I start this now, uh, I, uh, part of the conversation we didn't have because um, you're talking about sort of zombies metaphor also was ethnicity and race and horror, which is a whole other um, long conversation. I'm sorry that we actually didn't get to that because um, that's, that's interesting and multi-layered as well. But I suspect part of it is because the, the metaphors change for the people. And again, I really think that the, one of the things that I've discovered in the fantastic is that people don't seem to place metaphor on it anymore. Like for some, just a shambling monster that's going to eat you <laughs> is enough. Like they don't, they don't need it to be or represent something else. Um, a person transforms into a werewolf, that monster is enough. It doesn't have to represent sort of internalized fears or something. And I find that that's a really, as a creator for me, that's a really interesting thing. Because I do like um, fiction to have its layers and I like things you know, to be stand-ins for larger conceptual ideas. but. I'm discovering a shambling monster is sometimes best as a shambling monster, 
or at least best received as one. I guess so. It's about 8.30. Um, any last thoughts? I mean, Sean, you've been pounding home today. You have anything else? <laughs> oh. Uh... If not, don't worry about it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I can't think of anything clever to say. Yes. Uh, any last thoughts on four? Any suggestions for students uh, who might be interested in writing or drawing um, or making films about horror? Anything to think about? I would say be open to uh, finding your inspiration from new places that are unexpected. Because sometimes those scary things can come from very unexpected places. Yeah, I would just say go there. Like the place that you think you're not <laughs> supposed to, it's for yourself, where you're like, this will make people think I'm really messed up if I do this. <laughs> but it feels to me like the scariest possible thing ending. You just have to do that, you know, in that way. And then they do think that when you're at the soccer game and you're like, oh. <laughs> but it's okay. It's all right. Because you have a cool job. Right. And you get to go home and write scary stuff. Yeah, I think it's pretty much that. I mean, try to find your own voice, no matter. I mean, you have to be open for, for influence, for, for critics and everything. But it's very important that you stand for your, your own voice, your own vision. That's it. Uh, I guess when um, uh, creating stories, I guess the one thing that, or at least visually representing them and actually bringing them to life, um, your choice of what actually does tell the story, what doesn't, what you need and what you don't need, uh, I found it a great tool to boil it down. If, it does, if the story holds true, and especially in horror, if the fear is still there, if the beast <coughs> is still lurking and you know, that suspense still stands, you know, how much do you really need to add? And I think, I think color plays a great part in that. Uh, to speak to something uh, before, um, I highly recommend, recommend collaboration and debate as to what, you know, what those tones, what that atmosphere, what that mood really is. Um, you know, because almost every facet of what we do, you know, we try and, or at least speaking for myself, try and, try and make it, you know, as narratively relative as possible. You know, so that the line work, you know, as well as the color and the design and the composition and the control of blacks and all that other yada, 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 you know, really, really does contribute to the story as opposed to being decorative or, you know, kind of loose uh, and kind of willy-nilly. Stay away from willy-nilly. He'll get you. Um, I wanted to tell two thoughts. Um, one, if you're gonna steal, steal well. Uh, we all borrow, it's always best to borrow from the best sources. Don't be afraid to look back. Uh, we've been talking particularly about a lot of old films, a lot of old books. There's great, um, great ideas, um, both for uh, inspiration for actual horror and um, ideas about structure, tone. Um, so certainly, um, you know, look back as well as forward. But speaking of looking forward, um, uh, several futurists um, are encouraging design students, uh, particularly artists, to look to nature for inspiration for their design. I would also suggest the same for horror. Um, there's a lot of really, really scary shit out there in the world that, uh, that exists already. Um, you know, keep an eye out for it. It can inspire all sorts of stories. So, uh, thank you very much for joining us.